Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Apologies for the delay in starting. That's my muddle, I'm afraid. Um, but we are going to start now. So again, thank you very much for coming to SOA Research Presents Environment this evening. My name is Sarah Teasley. I'm reader in design, history, and theory, and head of program for the history of design at the Royal College of Art. Um, I also lead a research group in the School of Art and Humanities around the theme of environment. And this lecture series, as you may know, um, is about presenting the themes that are really core to what we do in the school, the, the themes that we identify each year as pressing um, and urgent for all of us to address, and in many cases that we're already addressing in our research um, as artists, as designers, as researchers, as thinkers, as writers and curators, and so on within the School of Art and Humanities. Um, so we have thought already this year about me, not me, but the concept of me, and we've thought already about entanglement. Um, tonight's event is the third in the series, um, and so we'll be thinking around environment. In the research group, we've looked at environment from a number of angles, um, thinking about different ways to conceptualize our relationship to the environment, and fundamentally what we've really been doing is problematizing whether we even could think about or should be thinking about our relationship to the environment. What, is, what are the problematics that emerge from such a binary way of thinking from the start? And what happens if we reconsider and look at different ontologies that see humans and the environment in different relations? So we've been looking a lot at human-animal relations, human-environment relations, and thinking about different in ways of engaging with the political environment, the social environment, as well as the physical environment. Um, so it's within that context that I'm absolutely de uh, delighted to present our two speakers for this evening, um, Dr. Joanna Bonert and Dr. Alexandra Daisy Ginsburg. Um, Joanna is, a, um, is at Loughborough, where she is lecturer in design and the creative industries. Uh, she is a, um, a, has a background in design research um, in ecologically literate design theory and specializes particularly in the politics of design transitions and the visual communication of complexity. Uh, she is committed to advancing critical and ecologically engaged design, um, and her research really sits at the intersection of design, environmental studies, and politics, drawing on cross-disciplinary debates from ecological feminist and decolonial theory to inform an expanded design practice. Um, we've invited Joanna this evening because her work really models a kind of practice um, that, we aim, well, that we aim to undertake in the school as well, particularly this kind of intersectional, informed, engaged practice, uh, whether we're practicing as historians, as filmmakers, as artists, or in any other form of creative um, and engaged practice. Um, following Joanna's talk, we'll be hearing from Ag Alexander uh, Daisy Ginsburg. Dr. Alexandra Daisy Ginsburg is an artist working across disciplines and media, exploring the human values that shape design, technology, science, and nature. Through installations, fictions, writing, and curatorial projects, Daisy examines why we make things, what those things are, and their relationship with us and the world. Uh, so again, Daisy will be talking about the kind of intersectional, engaged, critical practice um, that again really epitomizes the way that we want to be working and think we are working within the school here at the college as well. Uh, but I will hand over first to Joanna, then to Daisy. Okay, thank you, Sarah, for inviting me, or us both here, to talk about this important and still under uh, addressed area. So the environmental context has been taken for granted for a long time. And over the last 50 years, environmental scholars have analyzed the historical dis dismissal of environmental concerns and mapped new contours of ecologically engaged ways of knowing. Um, but the legacy of an economy, a culture, and knowledge systems developed based on the dismissal of environmental concerns makes uh, all kinds of environmental challenges and, and, and um, climate change a severe challenge. Okay, so today we'll, my talk will be talking about the intersection of these three areas. It's, it's also um, the title of my book, Design Ecology Politics. 
as Kat just has came out last last year, published by Bloomsbury. Um, and I'll be addressing these themes um, um, uh, I'll be updating what the work in my, in my book on, um, based on um, two recent papers. Um, the one that I published uh, in December, Anthropocene Economics and Design. And so uh, we'll talk a, bit, a little about design economies and, and um, Anthropocene economics. And one coming out next month um, for the European Academy of Design and published in the Design Journal. Um, as a um, supplement to the design journal, Ecocene Design Economies, um, three, co three Ecologies of Systems Transitions. And so I'll, I'll be introducing these ideas in, in four parts. I'll start with this, uh, the um, th uh, part one will be about um, framing the current epoch. And uh, then I'll be introducing the idea of there be three ecologies and the, um, bringing the idea of ecocene into design and then talking about the intersection of design and economics and, uh, and economic theory um, fit for the challenges of the Anthropocene. And so uh, fleshing this out a, a little bit more, I'll be um, talking about three ways of, of framing the current epoch, um, the, the three ecologies concept, and the expanded and the expanded conception of design, and um, uh, the proposals for Anthropocene economics. Okay, starting with naming the epoch. Okay, I'm sure everyone here is 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 aware that geological time is, is it has been measured historically in the procession of epochs and eras and that uh, the, there's currently a new name proposed for the geological epoch where humanity is dramatically um, affecting geological processes. And so the Anthropocene is po proposed by geologists and other earth scientists to describe earth systems, the changes in earth systems, including um, um, severe um, disruptions in planetary boundaries. And so the name draws attention to, to environmental change, but it also does other things. And Jason Moore is one of the prominent um, critics of the Anthropocene concept. He, he, he explains that conceptualizations of, of a problem and efforts to resolve the problem are always tightly connected. So too are ways to think about the origins of a problem um, and how we think through possible outcomes. And so, what is at stake right now is an interpretation of the global price crisis that is appropriate to our time and relevant to our movement's eras of, of, of transformation. And while the Anthropocene concept ha has been um, doing important work and it's, and it's, and it's um, got a lot of traction in the scientific community, um, science is not the only domain that should be participating in the naming of the current epoch. And so there's three, I mean, there's more than three, but there's three proposals that I'm going to be talking about in the next couple of minutes. And the Anthropocene um, um, concept is, is a concept proposed by, by the scientists, and it answers the question, what is occurring? The Capitalist concept um, answers the question, why is this occurring? It's, it's, it's the concept proposed by the political theorists and um, um, critical theorists, yeah, and political ecologists. Um, and then the ecocene concept is, 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 has been proposed, well, it's being proposed by just um, a few of a, a few, uh, so far only two that I know of, um, design theorists. Um, and, what, and what we're asking is what would we like to occur? And so we have the, um, the descriptive, the critical, and the generative. Um, or the transformative. And so this idea of what is occurring is, 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 has come from Jason Moore, who, who I've already um, introduced, and he, he wrote, the evidence amassed by the scholars working on the Anthropocene concept is indispensable. Such ev evidence outlines the problems and, and, um, and answers the first question. But 
the problem with the concept is that it um, describes humanity as an undifferentiated whole. And so, um, and so this this problem, so this the the uh, uh, the the the. Uh, the people cr critiquing the Anthropocene concept uh, have been um, amassing, especially in critical theory, but also within um, visual theory. Uh, for example, T.J. Demos is, is looking at Edward Bernanski's work, and he describes how this, the, the, his photographs um, um, do work such as they generalize responsibility for the destruction to species being, and this is a key, and he describes this as a key ideological trope of the Anthropocene. And Audrey Malms um, claims that to pre to portray social relations as the natural properties of a spe of a species is nothing new. Dehistoricizing, universalizing, externalizing, and naturalizing a mode of production sp specific to us certain time and place. These are the classic strategies of ideological legitimation. And, and, and this matters because without antagonism, without this identification of the specific things that are going on, there can be no change in human society. Species thinking on climate change only induces paralysis. If everyone is to blame, no one is to blame. And so it's important for us to be more specific about what exactly it is that the anthropos are doing to destabilize climate systems and other planetary boundaries. And, the, and only and, and it's, this is the work that creates more other options. And so Mo, Mo, Jason Moore asks, does the Anthropocene concept obscure more than it illuminates? And so, we're in, so in investigating the specific mechanisms that undermine the envi environment, um, we see that the ideas, the structures, the models of development that drive Earth system change and enable the destruction of environments. And Bruno Latour describes the, the Capazine as a swift way of ascribing responsibility to whom and to where it belongs, and thereby res informs um, responsive strategies. So Moore, Haraway, um, Donna Haraway, Bruno Latour, all describe the Anthropocene concept as, as uncritically importing Western rationality, imperialism, and anthropocentricism, and thereby narrowing options for the development of sustainable alternatives. And, and, and um, Jason Moore's, uh, well, they've, they've all written about the Capazine co concept, Jason, Jason Moore most, most um, prolifically. Um, and the Capazine comp concept offers the critical position that it's the logic of capital that drives the disruption of Earth systems, not humans in general. But of course, it's fiercely um, contested on Twitter and elsewhere. Um, but interestingly, um, it's gaining traction, um, and um, this is a, a was a debate on the Capazine by um, Professor Mark Maslin, who's the same, who's, a, who's the physical scientist that wrote the article in, that I showed you earlier in Nature, on the cover of Nature, on, on the Anthropocene. And so um, not, it's, it's moving out of that critical theory space um, into uh, beyond, which I think is, 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 is excellent. Um, and yet, and so, Donna Haraway says that the Anthropocene must be as short and as thin as possible. But the Anthropocene doesn't, I mean, even the Capitalocene doesn't do everything that we need it to do. Um, and, so, uh, and so moving on to design theory, we have um, Rachel Armstrong who wrote, there is no advantage, or no, who said this, he, um, this is from a, a conference in 2015 um, in Toronto. Um, there is no advantage um, to us to bring the Anthropocene in the future. The mythos of the Anthropocene does not help us. We must reimagine the world to enable the Ecocene. Um, okay, so there's other proposals. Um, um, and, and more beyond this, um, 
I'm not, I'm, I'm not going, I'm not going to go into the Clutho-scene and the Geno-scene, but I just wanted to flag them up. Um, I agree with both of them, um, and I like to um, think that the eco-scene could um, encompass those ideas in, in a more, um, um, potentially a, a more um, palatable way for um, water consumption. So the eco-scene um, concept suggests that, that new ways of understanding social and ecological relations are emergent. The eco-scene concept shifts focus from the description of the problem, um, which would be, would be the Anthropocene, um, to the analysis of, the, of where the problem is coming from, which would be the Capocene, to the generation of new options. And so it includes the scientific analysis of the, of the Anthropocene, the critical perspective of the Capocene, and the ecologically engaged generative perspective. And I'll, and I'll add a lot more um, elements to this as, we, as, as, as this talk goes on. Um, three ecologies. Okay. And so my book was called Design Ecology Politics. This is not the three ecologies I'll be talking about. Um, I'm, I'm talking, referring to the mental, the social, and the environmental. And so one of the most powerful formulations of ecological theory, um, in my mind, is Gregory Bateson's description of the ecological crisis uh, as originating in the domain of uh, ideas. And, um, and this is a domain where uh, most of us are governed by epistemologies we know to be wrong. So he described an a basic epistemological error as, well, as, as a series of, of foundational errors and the assumptions that um, systematically discount the environmental context. And so the dismi this dismissal and these ideas undergirth um, contemporary ways of knowing ha and have, in have been embedded into all disciplines and practices, in including design. And so Bateson, Bateson was the first to describe um, the environmental crisis as a, as a series of problems that cannot be addressed in isolation um, from so social and psychological um, dilemmas in, with, with this three ecologies concept. And it was, and it was further developed uh, in Felix Gerarty's The Three Ecologies. And so Gerarty proposes that mental ecology, social ecology, and environmental ecology are three realms that cannot be dis disconnected. And in theory and practice, we must wor work with the three ecologies um, simultaneously. And for Gar Gerarty, it was our failure to work with these three realms, the mental, the social, and the environmental, at once that creates the contradictions and stunts our efforts to address environmental problems. And so in, in the three ecologies, he, he wrote, so wherever we turn, there's the same nagging paradox. On, on the one hand, the continuous development of new techno-scientific means to potentially resolve the dominant ecological issues and reinstate socially useful activities on the surface of the planet. And on the other, the inability of organized social forces and constituted subjective formations to take, take hold of these resources in order to make them work. And so in response to this dilemma, Gerarty calls, calls for an ethopolitical articulation that will consider the dynamics between the three ecologies for the production of human existence itself in new historical contexts, literally reconstituting the modalities of group being through communicational interventions for the modification and reinvention of the ways we live by the motor of subjectivity. Um, and this, will, this, this work will war, must ward off by every means possible the entropic rise of a dominant subjectivity. And so Gararty calls on cultural practices, all cultural practices, in a position to intervene in the individual and, um, and collective psychic formations to nurture this new ecological sen sensibility and subjectivity. And um, so it seems to me that design is, is well placed to respond to this call. And design as, as a practice that is um, um, associated with the fine arts, it navigates subjectivities, um, it's where, uh, and designers are adept at provoking particular emotional responses with illustrations, with emotive um, capacity of fonts, 
the emoji, even the design of cars. Typically, this is used to sell things, but it can also be associated with various identities and how we feel about ourselves, constructed by designers. And so design inter, inter negotiates this intimately, intimately intertwined space between self, society, and the environment, and is well um, placed to do the work of uh, creating uh, this potential future ecocene as a, as a curative ca catalyst for cultural change. Um, where the generation of new futures is driven by ecologically literate ways of knowing. And so here an, an, another element to the ecosystem concept is, 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 this, is this ontology, epistemology, and ethic um, emerging from, from critical ecological thought, which is this, this, the, 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 the ecological brought into our knowledge systems and not just in the environmental sphere, but in the social sphere and in the mental, the personal sphere. And it's bringing these three spheres together with informed by this, um, this lacking, um, this, you know, the, the dismissal, the historical, we've historically dismissed the ecological in the same way that we've historically dismissed um, women's interests, in the same way that we've historically dismissed the interests of, of people of color and um, all kinds of other um, um, oppressions that we're trying to now address. Um, so this is very, m I've, I've tried to link um, the eco scene with the um, other um, types of oppression and I've, I've even been using the word ecocyst in the same way that you would use sexist or racist. Okay, ecosystem design. Okay, so design sits at a pivotal sense-making and change-making space to facilitate ecological transitions. But we much, must, must engage much more deeply with the ecological thought to transform the errors embedded into current system structures to redesign um, the political economy of design itself. And so part of this, um, the way that I've been conceptualizing this work is, is, is the um, way in which design works from, um, 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 from ways of, of knowing and seeing and facilitating new ways of seeing through making new visual um, representations. And the, and this and so this is like a a a change making practice when when it when it wants really engaged, um, and so actions come from our beliefs and our worldviews, and so seeing, knowing, and doing are all interrelated, and design can help people make sense of complexity and enable new ways of understanding the world and and create new ways of living. And so this perception, conception, action is, is um, cycle is helpful in changing new paradigms and putting new paradigms into practice. And this is all happening in design uh, anyway um, as design expands its, its field of engagement. And um, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Well, some of you will be familiar with this. Um, the Continuum of Design Approaches by Terry Irwin, where she, where she looks at the expanded, um, um, ex expanded um, conception of design, moving from um, service design, it's been around for several decades, and design for social innovation also around, to more newer practices such as transition design. And she doesn't um, talk about design activism. I've, t I've talked about that more. Um, and systems-oriented design should be in there as well, I think. Um, and this is something that I've been working with um, transition design, and especially with mapping practices and how mapping can f facilitate that, um, that, that, that this type of, um, these types of approaches in design. But um, it all very much depends on this ecological 
engagement and this real uh, a very deep seated understanding that we're not just fighting for something out there to save that thing out there. This is like us fighting for our own. We are nature. This is us fighting for ourselves. And so, um, and so here we have a, another element, ecocene facilitated by expanded design practices, transition design systems oriented design, design activism. Okay, finally, um, Anthropocene design, economics and design. So this is, um, you can get this online, um, it's open access um, paper I wrote, it, wrote for CG Journal. Um, um, Anthropocene economics ec and design, heterodox economics for design transitions is where um, a lot of this content um, comes from in, in this part. And so in this paper, I, I describe how design has a role to play in, in facilitating, or it could have a role to play in facilitating heterodox economic transitions, um, but um, both design and this is going to take significant shifts in design and in economics for us to really work to, w um, to bring um, at the intersection of, of, of these two fields. And so some of, the uh, some of the things I've taken inspiration from includes David Orr's um, recent um, chapter in um, the Rutledge Handbook. And, and David Orr is, is, all, is a has always been an inspiration for me. He's, he's the founder of the concept of ecological literacy, which I, I see as, as, as a critical, a key concept in, in sustainability literacy, or in sustainability education. Um, and so in this, in this um, chapter, he describes how all design exists in the larger framework of the political economy by which costs and benefits are distributed within society and across generations. So economic structures encourage certain types of values, practices, and design outcomes and ways of living um, with social and environmental consequences. And for this reason, sustainability, the, um, sustainability is a problem that is not just with the particular techniques of design, which have become very sophisticated, but is with the haphazard structures, economic, political, social, in which design occurs. Um, which slow the efforts to take ecological design to the necessary t uh, scale. And so the rules of the system only permit only change only at the margins. And so the practice of ecological design needs to be applied to the larger system of politics, laws, and economics to design social systems that will work with rather than against natural processes. And so this n involves a, 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 a quite a dramatic shift in the way that economic um, um, systems currently function. And here we have a, a, a um, conceptualization of, of the, the current economic system where the market is the dominant um, space where the um, priorities are directed and um, it's very unstable. And so we need to have, have this kind of um, transformation um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that might occur, um, thanks to some new ideas in design theory um, um, and in economic theory. And so I've done a little, um, I've done quite a lot over over the last five or six years. I've been um, working at this intersection and looking at writing about um, green economics and various economic theory. Um, ecological economics, feminist economics. This is the um, iceberg model of feminist economics, looking at like the types of work that is is um, um, compensated in our economy and the types of work that isn't compensated. And I know that um, Kate Rayworth has, has been at the RCA, so you're probably some of you will be very familiar with her work. Um, her donut economics a, 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 one a bestseller over the last couple of years, and she writes about an economy that is distributed by design as one that whose dynamics tend to disperse and circulate value as it is created, rather than concentrating it in ever fewer hands. So in an economy that is regenerative by design is one in which people become full participants in the regenerative um, or 
um, Earth life-giving cycle so we can thrive within pla planetary boundaries. This is our generational cha design challenge. And so Kate is an economist, but she's very committed to design. She's, she writes a lot, you know, she writes about drawing and about how design works to help people understand that the economy is a designed system. I mean, not designed as in like people sat in a studio and designed it, but it was constructed to do certain things based on the ideas that were around at the time. And um, in at the, when, during the, especially historically, when the economy was, the rules of capitalism were first constructed, the, the you know, we didn't, uh, the environment was just not on the agenda. Okay, and so she um, uses these images in her book and, um, Moving in, into design theory, there's been quite a lot of um, um, written lately in design theory at the intersection on economics. Um, I've, I've, I've referenced quite a lot in my, in my chapter if you're interested. But I'm just going to um, talk about Guy Julius' work on, on economies of design and design economy. So hi, this is his book, um, Economies of Design, where he describes economies as design as he describes how um, what is valued in neoliberal economics determines the logic that is embedded in design. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, um, Kate, these, Kate, these are images of Kate Rayworth. On, on, on the one side, you have this, 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 this sort of problematic um, um, illustration, traditional illustration of how economics works. And this is like, um, so basically, economies of design describes the ways in which um, um, a certain logic gets embedded into design practice, whereas design economies can encourage different types of values by design by the redirection of, of typically local economic processes with design um, practices. So, um, so design economies can also be design services and systems that regulate economic transitions and relationships on various scales, normally um, m more easily like micro and personal or mesro, sort of local, but you know, potentially even macro and international. Um, the theoretical work in this, in this area, is, um, I think, open space for um, design to um, function um, in the development of new economies and encouraging new values by design, um, and values supporting sustainable transitions. Okay, so this is um, Kate Rayworth's vision of a, um, a donut economics. And this is a, um, um, some work I made with Angela Morelli in 2009. Angela Morelli was a graphic designer, and this was the, the work of um, Herman Daly, who's one of the pioneer ecological economists. Um, um, this is the, 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 his vision of a steady state economic system. So another w example of, of design um, um, capturing um, economic, um, the an economic proposal, and, and, and in this particular example, what we have is the very abstract um, process ideas on the top moving down to more uh, more concrete policy pr proposals. Okay, so um, I mean, this here now we have five um, um, characteristics of the eco scene, and the last one being, it, and it's very important. I don't think that it can. You know, we'll get there without it. Is is it's dependent on a redirection of the political economy of design, with um, re regenerative and distributed, and those are, those are Kate Rayworth's words, um, design economy, design economy is is, is Guy Julius words, and, the, and this um, is 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 basically it. And so the eco scene carries the baggage um, of eco which is undoubtedly um, very um, difficult in this culture. Um, there's an, a, um, in my new paper, I've ri written um, 
the, um, the one that, that comes out next, w next month, for in, there's a profound anti-ecological bias in our culture. Um, and this is associated with the intersect uh, intersections of patriarchy, capitalism, colonialism, and imperialism. It, the eco scene uh, is uh, undoubtedly a hard sell. And so I don't think it will necessarily happen. But design is well placed to make the eco scene socially acceptable and even desirable should designers decide to do that kind of work. With their skills, even the most unethical corporations on the planet are welcome into people's homes. Designers have the capacity to make the eco scene possible. Moving beyond the limitations of a reductionist model of human psyche and knowledge systems, designers are well in place to encourage relational and ecological ways of knowing and sensibility. And with this radical ecological perspective, designers are supposed to make transitions to another world possible and not not only possible, but desirable. And this is um, some tape by my um, friend Noel Douglas, and that's it. Thank you. So it's wonderful to be back here. I haven't been in this building since my Viva um, over a year ago. So thank you, Sarah, for the invitation. And um, it's wonderful to be part of this series. Um, so we've heard a little bit about visions of better futures and a very concrete proposal for one. But I want to talk about how I have experienced these promises of better futures from within the more conventional design practice. And I spend a lot of time with designers and technologists um, of many different disciplines, and I heard this promise a lot. And we design new technologies or products to improve things, to change existing situations to better ones, to paraphrase Herbert Simon. We assume that design makes things better. But what is better? What does better mean to each of us in our own everyday lives and from as you know, our desires change through a day? Could we say it's greener, more profitable, more user-friendly, or all of the, these things at once? Is this better? And I would argue that in many ways, yes that it's stronger and lighter and safer than the glass bottles it replaced. The plastic bottle made of PET plastic was a marvel in the 1970s and the result of you know, decades of engineering as a way to solve the problem of holding carbonated drinks. It's better, but it's also much worse, as we know that single-use plastic is great for the economy, but increasingly we're finally coming to terms with the disaster that it is for the environment and our health and for other species, of course, too. The plastic bottle is an everyday example of how design and technology can be used to solve a particular problem, to solve a brief, and to deliver new and perhaps much bigger problems in the process. And I began to become obsessed with this problem of better, this paradox, and I began to see it everywhere, because better is used to set us everything from water to pizzas to rival political ideologies. But better doesn't mean the same as good. It fits any agenda. Better for some will be worse for others. It's contingent on people and contexts. So how can this word that is so powerful still be the thing that we're, we're driving towards and, and a word that has no defined or shared value? And I wrote my PhD about this problem um, because I realized that whenever we hear this word, we need to be asking, what is better? Who's better? And who decides? Now, the problem with all of this is that better is a human value. And I'm meant to be talking about nature this evening. And the problem is that this doesn't really apply to nature. Does nature, and if we are part of nature, then that becomes a more interesting question. Does nature care about better? So this evening, I want to show you four different projects, one much older, and three that I've been working on over the last year and to think about how I'm using them to explore what better means for different people and non-people. Um, and argue, sort of ultimately to argue that thinking about better matters, even if it's a way to step away from it. So I want to step back, though, um, to where I started in this space. This is in 2004, this image. And I first learned about synthetic biology 
in 2008 when I was doing my master's at the RCA. And this is a very early example, and it was still just sort of state of the art at that time. Um, it's a plate of bacteria that have been engineered to go dark when they're exposed to light, like photographic film, and it was made by undergraduates um, entering a genetic engineering competition. And today, synthetic biology is something that we hear more about in the news, and it is far more advanced. We, uh, synthetic biologists are uh, applying engineering principles to the design of biology from everything from bacteria to mushrooms to cows, mosquitoes, and even humans. And like elsewhere, dreams of a better world are driving the vision making of this film, of this field, and the um, and driving um, what gets made today. So in my PhD, I was trying to untangle from my own work in synthetic biology, hanging out with synthetic biologists and making projects with them, and curating and designing projects around the field. Um, what better actually meant to the synthetic biologists that I was working with. And the fundamental desire was to make biology better. And for the engineers involved, that meant making it engineerable, making it manipulable, uh, making it into a design material, making it more like computer code. A second group I saw was trying to make the world better. So using this better biology to deliver a better world. But to them, that better world was uh, very much aligned to the economy and to maintaining the economy as it is. It was about designing new processes to deliver the same things that we already have. So this is jet fuel made by bacteria secreting the fuel. This is a, a microscopic image. And a third more radical meaning of better really um, appeals, and appeals to me and terrifies me simultaneously. And that is the idea of bettering nature itself. And I would argue that this subgroup of synthetic biologists um, sort of at some points want to emancipate themselves from nature, to, be, to make nature better. Um, and by that, it, it means to improve it, to solve its problems, to fix it, um, to save us from it, and to save it from us. So this is an engineered mosquito that has been designed um, never for its progeny not to survive. It's made by a company called Oxitec. So the mosquito becomes a design object in this space. So this has been kind of the, the world that I was embedded in for the last 10 years, is trying to understand what synthetic biologists were designing, what good design would mean in this space, and who would get to decide. But crucially within all of this is the idea of bettering nature itself and bettering biology, applying a distinctly human value, a human mm -hmm. desire system onto the world around us. And another thing that I sort of learned along this process is this idea of trying to change your existing situation to a preferred one. The idea of bettering the world through design was quite problematic. Um, I find this model really um, that's used a lot in, de in design, especially in critical and speculative design, as a way of looking forward to possible preferable and other futures, really difficult to deal with because it only has a single vantage point from where we're looking forwards. I also think it stops us being able to, um, you know, we, we can only choose between the futures on offer. It also stops us looking at the present as a space of change. Instead, we can only look forwards. And it doesn't give us multiple vantage points. Um, so I'm much more interested in the way of how we accommodate our messy, complex world, where all our multiple dreams of better, both past and future, coincide and, and exist alongside each other. And actually a model that acknowledges that um, that <laughs> you know golden ages like take back control or make America great again sit against and alongside and often um, feed into visions of technological futures. So I'm going to show you how a few projects um, that I've done sort of start to deal with these different spaces. And the first um, was is um, from 2013, and it really looks at how presents, uh, histories and futures can start to address the present. So in 2013, I went to a conference where conservationists and synthetic biologists were meeting for the first time to discuss whether they have anything in common. And those aren't two groups of people that you um, traditionally would find in a room together. And I was really struck by their different ideas of what was better. The synthetic biologists 
Um, we're looking forwards, trying to create new biodiversity for the benefit of humanity. Meanwhile, the conservationists were looking backwards, very pessimistically, trying to stop the influence of, of humanity on biodiversity, trying to preserve what already exists. And there was this one moment in the present where their interests were um, sort of were convening. And the backdrop of this, of course, is the sixth extinction, which um, I'm sure you've, you may have heard of, which is um, the idea that's being proposed that we're currently undergoing a ex mass extinction event of biodiversity attuned to the scale of, of the loss of the dinosaurs. And something really interesting was raised at this meeting was, well, could we use synthetic biology to create new life forms to infect nature, to save it? And that means doing things like engineering coral and releasing it into the natural environment, or whatever that means, um, as a way to uh, help coral protect themselves against rising water temperatures. So I began to wonder, well, what would the wilds look like in this synthetic bio biological future? And who would get to decide? So this project um, was the result called Designing for the Sixth Extinction, and to explore the dream of, of what was being discussed in this room, and, and is in that room, and is something that has continued over the years, um, I built an imaginary world. So um, the large light box on the left contains what looks like um, an image of a pristine, biodiverse forest. Um, but when you look closer, you begin to see some unusual things lurking in the undergrowth. And in this fiction, companion species have been designed but designed only to preserve existing biodiversity. So there's four organisms, and each is designed as a, um, described as a machine using the instrumental language of patent applications. So I'll just show you one. This is the self-inflating antipathogenic membrane pump, um, a kind of fungus designed to fight a very real disease called sudden oak death, for which no cure yet exists. Um, and within this project, I'm using real references from synthetic biology and the state of the art of the science to tether the fiction to the present and also, crucially, to make it recognisable to synthetic biologists because they are or have been an audience for my work. So this would run on an expanded DNA code, which had been suggested as a different operating system, uh, a bit like Mac versus Windows. You could release things into nature and they wouldn't affect the real nature. Again, whatever that means. Um, so within, I'm going through this project very briefly because I, I don't want to focus on it too much, but the idea within this world-building exercise was, was to take existing trends in ecology and extinction and synthetic biology and to map out a possible world to reveal problems and issues and new questions. And this is not meant to be a prediction or a proposal for a desirable or dystopian world, but just a way to think about, say, how corporate interests might influence the pre preservation of nature if we move forward in this way. And I really wanted to start thinking about how, if nature is entirely industrialized, um, does it still exist for us to save? So is this better? Who is it for? Who gets to decide? Um, uh, my glory moment was when it appeared on the cover of Fungal Genetics and Biology, um, a wonderful science journal, and the editors were using it as a way to get their readers, because um, they were outsiders to, as synthetic biologists, um, engineering uh, fungal, so they were, synthetic biologists were outsiders to this journal, and they were using it as a way to get their readers to think about what they should or shouldn't design as synthetic biology starts to penetrate multiple fields of science. So for me, this was an example of how a fictional future can effectively disturb the path of the present. And I, I found it was a, a powerful tool for that. But as time goes on, I did my PhD, started to think about these projects differently. And also my role as an artist and designer within the field and how, um, how I can collaborate more effectively but maintain my critical independence. So the next project is very new. I'm uh, fresh off uh, a number of installations, and I'm really excited to share with you this project, Resurrecting the Sublime. And I've been working with Christina Agapakis, who is the creative director of a biotechnology company called Ginkgo Bioworks, and the smell artist and researcher Cecil Tolas. And I've known them both for a long time, and um, I'll show you a little video uh, to start. 
Okay. So this is um, a fictional view of lava fields on the southern slopes of Mount Haleakala in Maui, Hawaii. The year is 1912. The forests are being lost to um, colonial cattle farming. One tree will be lost forever. The, hibis the Hibiscadelphus wilderianus. The Hawaiians called it Maui Hau Kuahivi, the mountain hibiscus. By 1912, it will be extinct. Its habitat lost, the plant lost, and the relationship between the two lost. But could we ever regain a glimpse of what was lost? So this is the question we've been asking in um, Resurrecting the Sublime. And this is it at the San Etienne Biennial last week um, near Lyon in France. And we've built two big vitrines, and each is filled with the smell of an extinct flower. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each of the two flowers in this installation um, and how the installation functions. So the first is the Hibiscadelphus wilderianus. Um, and this is Christina um, at the Harvard University Herbarium. In 2016, she decided with a team of synthetic biologists at Ginkgo Bioworks to try and resurrect the smell of extinct flowers. And this is not something that had been done before. So in the herbarium, she found 20 extinct flowers within the collections and started to work with them um, by taking tiny tissue samples. And this is the hibiscus itself. The next step was to go um, back to Ginkgo Bioworks. I'm going to show you a bit of footage, and then I'll show you some more about the scientific process itself. So Ginkgo is an incredibly high-tech biotech company where everything is roboticized, and they have the ability to um, do kind of mass output synthetic biology. So the, the process in this um, resurrection <laughs> uh, project was to get the DNA out of the tissue samples. And that itself is very difficult because it's all very old. The flower, the hibiscus, was, those samples were collected in 1910. So they had to work with paleogeneticists at the University of California, Santa Cruz, to actually extract those bits of DNA. But once they had the sequences, they were able to sort of see what they had, tiny pieces all broken up. They could then use um, an existing known organism and known sequences that encode for smell-producing enzymes called sesquiterpenes and try and match up their little bits of code with the bits um, in the known template and try and then see what they had, fill in the gaps, and work out if they could recognize and match known sequences that produce known molecules. Once they'd done that, they printed it or, or synthesized the DNA, and then they inserted it into yeast and grew the yeast to produce the smell molecule. So the, the new DNA going into the yeast tells the, molecule, tells the yeast to produce the, um, the smell molecules, and that can then be um, kind of taken out, out of the brew, and then uh, mass spectrometry is done to verify the identity of those molecules. Long process, very complex bit of science here, and they end up with a list of molecules for each flower. And there were three flowers in all that we've worked with. Once we had that list, Sissel was able in her lab in Berlin to actually rebuild the smells using identical or comparative molecules. And that's what's inside these vitrines. So we have a number of diffusers in the ceiling of each, and they are um, dispersing the smell throughout each space. And what's really exciting to me is that there's a contingency built into this project. What we've done is we've actually divided up the smells into four. Um, so once we've got the, the answer of what this flower might have smelled like, we've broken it up again into four. Because while we know which molecules the flowers may have produced, we don't know their quantities. So as you walk through these spaces, there's a mixing and a different smell every time you breathe in. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about where this flower actually comes from. This is Hawaii in a non-standard projection. Um, and this is the southern slope of Mount Haleakala. And you can see it's been denuded of forest. And that's something really important to this project, is that each of these flowers have been lost to colonial activity. So this is um, an excerpt from 1917 where um, the author talks about 
how um, extensive the devastations have been at the hands, basically, of foreigners, that the native forests have been destroyed all over Hawaii, and it's the cause of cattle ranching and other, um, the introduction of other animals that have destroyed it. So if we actually look back to what this landscape may have looked like and, and the community of plants and other species that this, this plant was part of, we realize how extensive the damage was. So this is a related hibiscus tree. Um, you can see the scale of this forest. And these were all photographs from that same slope at the same time. So when we were rebuilding the hill, the, the mountainside, we were trying to imagine what did this hill look like? What did the slope look like? in the middle of the extinction process. We weren't trying to rebuild as it was in its entirely natural state, but in a state where there's already an element of loss. Um, so here's our flower. And as you can see on the far left, there's just a few little buds. So when it actually came to rebuilding the flowers in, in the studio, to th which we did in Unreal Engine, a computer game engine, we had a real challenge because there's no drawing of this flower that exists. Everything is from written um, sources. So here we have the botanical description um, to try and piece together what this lost plant looked like. And we end up with um, this kind of imagery. So it's beautiful sound design by Sam Conran. Um, and this imagery that we developed for this project, um, this sort of very romantic um, device of using mist to reveal and, and bring us back into this space um, is very intentional. So these um, are in some of the exhibitions we've designed, these, these animations are played over, and they're a direct reference to the idea of the sublime, and obviously that's in the title of the project as well. So this is Philippe de, um, I don't actually have to say his name, Lutherberg, Lauterberg, who was um, an, uh, an artist in London in the 19th century and sort of a, a great example of the sublime in landscape painting. And what's really interesting about him as well is that he was a set designer on the London West End too. And he was trying, he tried to create sets where people would have this experience of the sublime. And the sublime is a um, kind of well, well worn concept, but it's quite, to me, quite relevant in this project. So the idea of the unknowable, the exposure to nature's immensity that makes us consider our position in it, but at the same time, there's a level of artifice to the experience. So we think of the traveler going up into the Alps in the 19th century, standing on the precipice to get that real kind of buzz of, of the big mountain. And there's also this idea of the technological sublime that carries into the 20th century with big engineering projects, which to me, this, this project, when I first learned about what Ginkgo had been doing, was um, really sort of gave me a sort of a dizzying feeling that Christina and her team were able to sort of peer back in time, give us a glimpse of the past in this way. So the second flower that we have in San Etienne is the Orbexillum stipulatum, or the Falls of the Ohio scurf pea. And it's a much more delicate um, flower. And it came from um, Kentucky. In fact, this is the this is present-day Louisville, and um, the flower grew on a tiny island in um, the Ohio River, which I think was about here. It was called Rock Island. And the flower was last seen in 1881, and I haven't been able to find a good reason for its extinction. One that I've read has been that the decline of buffalo populations or just general destruction of nature and the environs might have been a cause. Um, but certainly the island itself was completely lost in the 1920s when a large dam, US dam number 41, was built and flooded the island completely. And here we can look back at a more romantic idea of what that landscape looked like for better or worse. And for this one, we did have a flower to look at. Um, and this is what we built as a result.
colours a little off on the screen, so the, the flower is actually a very delicate purple colour. Um, and I just want to talk about one other aspect of the project is the natural history vitrine and references to natural history and taxonomies is something that I've been interested in for a long time in my work. Um, this is at Harvard in the Natural History Museum. And here we see the animals stuffed in the specimen and what was um, great fun for me was to see, in our case, the dead humans inside as the specimen. The human becomes the subject connecting the landscape and the lost smell um, and is the focus of this work. How do we change our behaviours? What do we do differently? And here we have the elements of the diorama inside the space. Um, so we have humans sitting on rocks and humans standing next to rocks and humans behaving um, as exhibits which to me is great fun. Um, and this is a little version of it that's at the Pompidou in a show at the moment, and um, a version of this will be going to the Cooper Hewitt. So I'm going to talk about one other project very briefly. I'm just going to show you a trailer, because we haven't finished. Um, and this is a different way for me, kind of coming back to this timeline, and it came out of my PhD research, was how instead of thinking about um, single sort of speculative futures, or in the case of resurrecting the sublime, multiple pasts that kind of leak into the present, how instead can we think about um, multiple parallel futures, generative means to actually um, think about how we change our behaviours or our impacts. So I'm going to show a trailer. Would it be possible to turn down the lights a bit? It's three minutes long, um, and I'll start now. Thank you. That's all you get. 
So that's, um, we're going to present it for the first time at the Vitra Design Gallery in July. Um, I have a solo show called Better Nature. And this project has been work in progress since the beginning of last year. And I presented it um, at the Media Lab at MIT a couple of weeks ago to a room uh, as a little installation to lots of astronauts and theoretical physicists and experts on people uh, of how not to contaminate Mars. And it was great fun because everyone says to me, well, OK, but then we'll go there. And I'm like, no, no, the whole point is that we're just going to colonize Mars with biology, and it's just not for human benefit. We'll make Mars different, not better. And they're like, yes, OK, but then we'll go there. No, no, the, the whole point is that there is, it's not for human benefit. And that's, I'm really looking forward as this project develops. Um, we've worked a lot with um, a number of experts um, in history of science and planetary sciences and um, uh, people at NASA who are very kind to join our speculations with us because astrobiology as a field of science in itself is speculative. The search for life elsewhere is something very much determined by human understandings of what life is like in terms of w looking for carbon-based life forms, looking for water and other planets. And so for this project, I really want to challenge um, some of the um, kind of colonial language, but also the expectations. Um, there's a fantastic team behind this. Um, led by Tom Betts um, and us in the studio and Yelena Viskovich. So lots of credits for what we're doing there. And I'm going to end just by talking about um, this and advertising the Journal of Design and Science, which is a project um, by the Media Lab at MIT and the MIT Press. And I was very fortunate to edit an issue with Natsai Audrey Chiesa. Um, and the theme is on other biological futures. We have 10 articles, and um, there's a final one coming up soon with um, Drew Endy, who's one of the architects of synthetic biology, and in conversation with Donna Haraway. Um, but we have a number of conversations between people who are all other to each other, many of them who hadn't thought about biodesign before. Um, it's open access, um, it can be licensed through Creative Commons, and each of these conversations are a starting point for really rich um, new areas for exploration. So we just put people in conversation and they had to find um, common ground but also talk to each other about their um, otherness to each other. Uh, so we have everything from Afrofuturists in conversation with paleogeneticists to historians um, in conversation with people expanding, uh, with a scientist expanding the genetic code. So I've talked about how humans dream of better and how I think there is no one better and instead our parallel worlds coexist and um, influence each other and past and histories shape our choices and actions today. And I'm trying to experiment with ways of kind of uh, revealing these processes, but also generating ways to think differently <coughs> about these problems. Um, because I believe that if we want to imagine other better biologies or better worlds or better natures to make them more possible, we have to ask these questions. What is better? Who's better? and who decides. And in this very particular context, this is the problem, is that the non-human doesn't get a vote, but also is not necessarily affected in the same way. And I've come back in the end to two of our extinct flowers who I imagine don't care that they're extinct. We care for their loss. And I'm thankful to them for allowing us to make this project, but also the project and sort of thinking about extinction in a space that is so focused on construction has been really fascinating. We're using biotechnology to talk about loss and colonialism, and that's a very different way of using these tools. And I hope it sort of kickstarts other kinds of projects that use these technologies to actually um, think about these kinds of issues and help us open them up more. Thank you. We have selected 16 extremophiles from Earth, and so in conversation with scientists, but also having to embark on our own research in the studio, we have chosen, um, we have planetary seeding stages where we start off with very extreme extremophiles, so ones that can exist in the, in the Antarctic on snow, so we have cyanobacteria. The next pioneers, we're using all this colonial language intentionally, are um, lichens, and so I'm smiling because the whole project is crazy 
Um, then we have some lichens, and then our third stage, they get a bit hardier, but they're all still Antarctic or desert plants. Um, even in the fourth stage where we have some cacti, the whole thing, having presented it to lots of scientists, they're like, well, but they can't think of any other species that might work. Um, yet, you know, there's a planetary protection officer whose job is to stop Mars getting contaminated. Um, and contaminate, contamination is a real issue because if we contaminate the planet. So the, the project is designed to open up all these fissures in the arguments for colonizing Mars. I don't think it's possible to wild Mars like that. Um, George Church at Harvard said to me, you're crazy, why would you send anything to Mars without life support? Um, but even if we get a little bit of wilderness, I think it will be beautiful. Just thinking about like color and form, would yeah. it grow in exactly the same way? So I that's guess? what we're doing. So we've, we've, this is very much work in progress and we have built a platform basically in Unity where we can, um, we now have the bare bones to start tweaking the aesthetics. We can start, we can, the next stage is start adding mutation and um, we have an ecosystem within there where we have different parameters, things affecting. So this is four months off exhibition. So I shouldn't even be showing it. So. <laughs> Hello, thank you. I'm Fernanda. I'm a second year uh, global innovation design student. And I'm really fascinated by synthetic biology and our relationship with nature. And in particular, I'm focusing on education and kids. And I'm curious to hear your perspective of what it'll be like for these you know, small humans that grow up in a world where we can already edit nature and de-extinct species and think about our human impact and if you've thought about that at all. Mm. I don't, so our project's not about de-extinction, I want to, and that's an important, no, 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 and it's uh, something that we're trying to talk about is, um, and maybe I didn't sort of specify enough, that the, for me, without the landscape, the plants are useless, so the same way you bring back a rhino without the environment and without the social structures to protect it um, from other humans and ourselves, um, it doesn't mean anything, and even if we were able to de-extinct something, um, what is the point of it? without its habitat. And so these flowers, we don't even know ha exactly how they smelled. It's the speculation because we can't tell the amounts. Um, so for children and education, I think knowing the what's possible is important, but it's also, um, I'm, it's a very scary future in terms of engineering biology because the forces that are um, determining what gets engineered are not necessarily uh, aligned with what's best, whatever that is, for nature. And those are the, the questions that I try and pose to synthetic biologists. Um, you know, ultimately, does nature care? No, we could do whatever we want with it, but who does it affect? Which peoples, which indigenous peoples, which environments, which ecosystems, which other species are we putting our will on? Uh, hi. I'm uh, Olaf, I'm in a sculpture course. I just, uh, listening to you guys talk, I was thinking that somehow you are kind of in different pages. Like one is, is talking about uh, stepping back and looking at uh, n different epistemologies and ontologies and considering ourselves as like something that's part of everything else and considering everything else. And the other one is kind of stepping forward and going into like oh, like what can we cha c change even more you know what i mean is that just like which my is which <laughs> <laughs> is that just my idea or is it i'm going crazy uh, you which, which one are you I mean, because yeah, I it to me it's different no no i don't i mean i see myself as both so okay <laughs> Well, because you said you had a slide about looking backwards yeah. and then looking forwards. Mm -hmm. And as if, I mean, when we, we look back, because there are certain um, ways that um, it, it, the ecological have, has functioned over millions of years that have allowed us to sustain you know, that have enabled the conditions that have made civilization possible. And those conditions are, are breaking down, as mm -hmm. you know. And so um, it is synthetic biology is like looking towards future possibilities and 
it all very much depends on us having the conditions that will make the synthetic biology labs possible. And so you know, I think that there is a, there is a quite a, um, I think you're doing very fascinating work, but it's, it's, it's like, it's very, um, you know, like as you've mentioned ha like many times in your presentation, there's, uh, you, you have to try to get a critical angle on what's happening. And there will be people who will try to use your work um, to just move ahead with their agenda, which is not necessarily, well, is very much not taking it anything that I had to say into account um, and is very much continuing a um, tradition of ignoring the building blocks that we need to pay more attention to. You know, there's not the same sort of agenda. So you know, the way that our work functions discursively in society to um, build different um, conceptions of nature um, is something that um, we have to consider. I mean, I think I am personally in, in favor of there being more types of conversations I of mm -hmm. nature. And so I like the fact, you know, I think it's important that there's, there are people doing critical work mm -hmm. within the domain that you're doing, <coughs> working, but I think it, it's, it's, it's extremely, it's, I find it quite a, dangerous place to be working as well. Yeah, it's not, I mean, my, a lot of my PhD was about the trouble that I encounter in this space. So um, for me, this project with the vitrines is so powerful to see people standing in an empty box, smelling, trying to experience lost nature and actually having an experience that doesn't need words attached to it, but really having quite a profound moment where they are standing there and other people looking at them and they're trying to experience something that's gone and that's, this is the first time I've used synthetic biology in a project, and it's, it, um, and I've not actually, my projects have always been about <coughs> it. It's the first time it seemed like a good way to actually engage with the technology and get people thinking about something, thinking about it differently. Could I actually jump in for just a second, and I'll hand over the mic. I was thinking about your question, and I think if we take a step back and think about the work that you're doing as designers and as creative practitioners, right, and so you're both you both talked about generating ways to think differently and the importance of looking from multiple perspectives. And I think this, it's interesting, and you know, whether you're being very direct and saying this is what we need to do, or whether you're problem posing in some more oblique ways, um, I think there are a lot of commonalities. And I would just like, mention another one being you've both chosen to engage very directly with communities who are historically not as open to sideways ways of thinking or problem posing. So I'm thinking about you know, economists and synthetic biologists or engineers, right? And so it struck me listening to both of you that you've both very specifically entangled yourselves with communities um, that are fundamental to changing how we work, how we think, how we conceptualize the world, but that also do make life more complicated for you. Um, you know, in the sense that, you know, Joanna, as you said, you know, is it, you know, are economists going to change the way that they work and think? You know, how do we actually do this? You know, are engineers going to change the way they work and think? So it seems that it's as much about the engagement and the entangling, um, and that there's a real commonality, you know, really, in, it's really interesting in terms of working as designers, as creative practitioners, that what you've said is, you know, we are going, and it's very harrowing, you know, we are going to locate ourselves in the heart of the trouble in some ways. I would, and that's why I said to your question, I don't. I see myself in both. Um, the, I mean, the Mars project is an independent project. I'm, you know, it's free reign to cause chaos for me. Where you know, in terms of, I can go and present to astronauts that will no humans will go to Mars, and that's very fun. But again, even in that project, I enjoy provoking the communities that the project is aimed at, which is to get the you know the astrobiology and space. Um, communities talking about why colonization is a good word for Mars um, because it never ends well for humans, non humans, and our environments. Any thoughts, Joanna, before we pass over the mic? No, no, take it. 
Thank you. Um, both talks were, were amazing in very, very different ways. But I, um, uh, to return to a point, I think, Daisy, there was a moment in your talk where you were you said, I'm here to talk about nature. And I found that really an interesting, a very different sort of thought process to, to Haraway or, or to this idea of kind of finding a kinship or a, a kind of trouble with nature that it kind of to think about environment as or as nature or environment as an other, as something other. Um, and I wonder if um, maybe you can talk a bit about how to kind of find agency and solidarity in nature that kind of complicates that kind of, um, that, that kind of dualist mm. idea mm. Of, of nature and man and man having a, a kind of mastery over nature in this kind of sublime othering of nature. Mm. Like where, where's the... I suppose the, the the friction in in um, in uh, in having that kind of mass that kind of speculative mastery mm. over over nature. Well, I, I mean, I very much believe that we are part of nature. And Paola Antonelli put it beautifully a few weeks ago um, in the opening for the Broken Nature Show, which I was I'm on the advisory committee for, is that what we do to nature, we do to ourselves. And I work with a community in synthetic biology who have a range of views as well, and it's wrong to say there's one set of views, but there is a dominant view that we can engineer biology or engineer nature, so nature is used as a, a space for us to control, um, and I, that's not exclusive to synthetic biology. Um, so in my work, I'm increasingly trying to find ways to talk about the relationship between humans and nature and technology and me find messy ways where they overlap and get you know, for me, last week in San Etienne, seeing all these kids running around inside the vitrines was a really happy moment because it's like, this is, f you know, like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what else I can do. I can be an activist. You know, these are the, the tools that I have to try and get people who wouldn't necessarily think about these issues. How can we tell stories um, and get people to engage with, the with these exact ideas that we are part of this environment, that it's not something that we have necessarily the right as humans to engineer. And the space community is an especially interesting community to me because there is this idea that humans will become better in space, that we can build a very utopian vision where we will be bettered by leaving Earth to creating our second, a second home, but that we will, the people who go will be the the community builders who will be able to deliver this better emancipated humanity. Mm. And, for, and George Church, again, I, when I spoke with him about these ideas, you know, he's like, we don't need any other species to go to space. We don't need any, even of our microbiome. He said, you know, you could just um, replace those all with chemical precursors. So the idea that the human can exist exclusively and at the same time be better without any other species to me is is the alien <laughs> species. Yeah. Um, and I so strongly believe that we exist, we need to exist on Earth in within the nature that we have co-evolved with. Do you think, so uh, it would be really interesting to hear mm. kind of both of you answer that question, but also uh, do you think this, and this is again, I think is a open question, but this idea of how we tell the story, how we readdress that story, the, the act of storytelling and mm. fictionalizing is kind of an important factor of politicizing these stories as well like how do we how do we configure and that's very present in your work this and in the talk particularly those ideas really came out but it's just that idea of fictionalizing or um telling stories what the, what the politic of that is um ca can i respond to mm -hmm. that so i mean that that to me speaks to this these this, this three ecologies concept because i mean the storytelling is for us learning that on a, a personal level and where, wh where we simultaneously have to put it into practice on a social level in, in our politics. And, and then that is reflected in what we do with the environment. And so, you know, I think in response to you, like drawing back to your, your first question, you, you'd think that the climate crisis would be the <laughs> severe enough now to of provoke the kind of humility that we need in relationship in relation to our um, in 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 how we um, deal with tech technology how we how we see new technology as um, you know the the risks that we 
that we might not be aware of when we bring new technology into the world, and, and that is um, clearly not something that, that we've learned like yet, and that is something that um, I, where I fear that the s synthetic biology is contributing to this sort of, you know, certainly not mm. your work, but other people's, um, uh, you know, techno tech, uh, the whole the field in its as a, you know, as it exists within within the scientific es establishment, it's certainly contributing to this narrative that we can continue along that that vein. And you know, uh, re referencing again um, Sarah's question about this entanglement, like I do think that we need to sort of get in there <coughs> to wrestle those sort of unpick. The, um, the the sort of problems in that space on like all those different levels. But I think that right now there's also very serious sort of theoretical problems that are, uh, proposals that are keep on keep on being um, presented and they're, they're still it's, uh, I think they're still going in the wrong direction, for example, like um, like MIT, that the journal, like I really don't like the way that they theorize the entanglement in that journal, because to me, it's, it's like, it's theorized in a way that's very convenient for capitalist modes of production, because if you, if you theorize the, the, the death of the artificial, then, and like, as if the artificial and nature are all just one, then you no longer can like look at the patterns and processes that have like sustained us for so many millions of years, and 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 as a as an example for what we need to, you know, the new we need new technology certainly, but we we need to be a lot more careful than we've been in, in the past, and we have to be like, you know, a, you know, much more aware of the limits of our own knowledge when we're when we're doing incredibly. Um, dangerous things. I, I agree, but I think that the problem is the cat is out the bag. It's happening. We don't get a say, and um, you know the the technology is advancing so rapidly in so many domains, as we all know, around AI, around synthetic biology, around um, it, everything. Um, that we, how do we catch up? How do we even get a foot in the door to ask these questions? And for me, it's been through. Um, working with the communities, so in synthetic biology, and and I again, I don't want. To, I'm not tarnishing synthetic biologists with a brush of like, of that they're bad. They're not. They're great. We. What are the tools? If this is a technology that we can use, how do we use it appropriately? What is good design with this technology? And who? How do we even begin to ask that question? Is something that is so important to me in my practice. Is that it's. Um, I don't know the answer. The synthetic biologists I work with often are very are visionaries who have very strong ideas that I strongly disagree with in some cases. Other times they're very good and sensitive ideas around how to work appropriately. I don't know if engineering coral is a good idea. I don't think anyone knows. I think it will happen whether it's a good idea or not. And um, how we get more and more people to engage with having a say, not, I'm not talking about public engagement, I'm talking about actually decision making is crucial and to do that we have to be informed and to feel empowered to say something. It's sort of a perfect lead mm -hmm. into the question I was thinking. Um, I'm, you're both using um, verbiage and uh, creating discussions that problematize technology in a way that I see a lot of parallels with in technophobic communities now, I'm thinking anti-vax communities, anti-GMO communities, and so I'm wondering how in having these conversations and broadening the conversation about the use of technology and nature and human intervention moving forward, how you make sure that you're not emboldening those groups and those discourses. Um, okay, well, 
you know, actually, I think that what's happened is that there hasn't been enough critical um, public discussion about technology, and that is why um, those movements have gotten sort of grown outside of institutional spaces. If the if we had the proper sort of critical discussions, then and we we created um, a culture where those ideas would really be fleshed out properly, then we wouldn't have all of these thriving sort of amateur, amateur um, critical, you know, what 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 ends up being conspiracy theories, but is are the people who are um, concerned that they're not getting the right information, and it is true that there is there are special interests that um, make it difficult for us sometimes, especially you know in some spaces more than others. In America, it's very difficult to get information about your food, for example. And that is just a fact. And if you live in those sorts of um, environments where you're not given the kind of information that you want, what, that you need to make informed decisions, then you start sort of making up, you begin thinking, you know, you begin wondering what's going on and you might make things up. And so what we need is a much more transport transparent and critical um, conversation about the technologies that we all exist within and that we depend on for our lives. And, you know, I don't see my, um, you know, my, my relationship to technology is, is how does it serve the, the communities that it is meant to serve? And whose, whose rights are or whose interests are being um, are being served, and whose interests are potentially being uh, who who have who, who where what are the consequences of a particular technology, and and often those those consequences aren't um, you know there's no they're not made they're not there's no space there's no institutional capacity to make. The consequences, uh, technological consequences, and people feel them. You know, people die because of um, like unintended consequences of technology. So, you know, the, 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 there are good reasons why there we have these problems. It's, it's, we've been irresponsible. Um, you look like you want to ask something. No, no, no. no I was going to say, would you like to say something? Um, mm, I'm not sure. So. There has been lots of discussion around speculative design. Uh, you know, Tony Dunn was my was my, taught me on my masters and was my um, my other PhD supervisor, um, and I don't think I, I don't I don't see myself as a speculative designer. It's not, and f because of the arguments in you know around that sort of linear uh, with the cone, like I am very keen on change in the present, and and I'm not. I want to frame the work differently. Um, that's not to say that I'm, you know, I'm not rejecting speculative design either. I think there's good speculative design. Some of my projects probably are speculative design. It doesn't really, I don't really, the labels aren't important, but where I know there has been critique is around, you know, fictional dystopias or utopias that, that are hard for people to read as, um, as fiction. And you could say, well, you know, you go to the cinema and you see a movie, and you, you know it's fiction. You know, the genetically engineered monster comes and kills everyone, and we know that that's not real. But that probably also has an impact on how we think about GMOs. I think banning fiction is a really bad idea. Humans are storytellers. Storytelling is a really wonderful way to get people to think and be imaginative and creative. 
So I don't think that we should say, well, design and art can't deal with fiction, um, because I think we would live in an impoverished world where we would just be aiming for, um, it'd be, it would be quite boring. And the end of the world, which is probably coming anyway, would get us. So <laughs> it would be even you know, less pleasurable to experience. Um, and, I read, and I say that jokingly, but I mean it. I, think I don't see how we can get ourselves out of this crisis. I think any means are good, and hope is important, which is why I wrote a PhD about better. And in my thesis, I didn't try and get myself out of better. I said, I'm going to stay within this framework and still say, how do we make these things better? I think hope is a really fundamental human um, uh, kind of feature. And so at the same time, we could say, well, we, it's too, too dangerous to make these stories because people may operationalize and weaponize them in other ways. I think that's true for everything as well. So um, yes, I try and say what's real, what's not real in my projects things may be misunderstood, but at the same time, they're intended to operate in a gallery. They sometimes leak into other spaces and take on a life of their own. But I tend to, um, as best I can, police what's seen as real or not real. Okay, I think we are out of time. So I'll just close by saying three things. Um, the first is that I think it's really interesting that for a talk or an, a, a, an event around environment, we've ended up talking about technology. And that reminds me that a lot of what um, we've been looking at this year around environment has been precisely this us-them relationship or the sort of human environment and, right, and problematizing that. And the, I think the fact that when thinking about environment in nature, we end up with technology tells us something about the messy, problematic nature of that relationship, um, you know, as well as something about humans' interest in ourselves, even though we, you know, it, it, it comes back to us. And so I think there's a lot more unpicking to do, um, which both of you are doing very, very closely in your work. Um, the other point is around hope and the present. Um, both of your work strikes me as incredibly hopeful. Um, and you know, whether it's the hope that design can change, the hope that people can change, um, the hope, you know, I, I, you know, there is a hope for the, us doing better or us behaving better um, in whatever way that is. Um, and with that comes a real focus, I think, on the present rather than the future, right? And so what you've given us tonight, both of you, is a call to do something now and with a deep skepticism around what is better, who decides, where is the power, who's speaking for anyone, can we change anything? but yet we must. So I think that came out really, really strongly. Um, feel free to disagree with me later if you'd like. And the third thing I will say is thank you very much for everyone for coming and thank you very, very much. And please join me in thanking um, Joanna and Daisy.